Hello, I'm Nancy Ford, series producer of POV, and today I am joined by prolific documentary filmmaker Lourdes Portillo. Portillo's films have focused on the search for Latino identity for more than 20 years. Her extensive body of work includes the Oscar-nominated Mothers of La Plaza de Mayo, co-directed by Susana Munoz, and broadcast as a part of POV's first season in 1988. Corpus, a home movie for Selena, which was featured on the POV series in 1999. The internationally praised narrative After the Earthquake, the critically acclaimed La Ofrenda, The Days of the Dead, Columbus on Trial, which screened at the Sundance Film Festival and as a part of the Whitney Biennial in 1993, and the film The Devil Never Sleeps, among many others. A filmmaker who moves freely between genres, Portillo's work is infused with visual poetry, irony, humor, and grit. Her work encompasses video installations, narrative films, documentaries, stage plays, and experimental films. Her career has inspired a generation of women filmmakers. Lourdes Portilla, welcome and thank you for joining me. No, it's a pleasure. Your body of work is so um, is so varied, and I think that one of the reasons why so many generations of, of women filmmakers specifically have have been inspired by you um, is because you've you've done all this tremendous cross genre work. You've you know you've done installation, you've performance. Talk a little bit about how you came to fully embrace just using whatever style you you want well I think that must be the metaphor of my life I cross the border you know so I have a double experience and um, I think in my family I was encouraged to learn as much as I could about other people and about other other things and to travel and to be open so in that way I think my filmmaking you know, represents, you know, kind of a sum of my experience and, and uh, who I am as a person. I use poetic metaphor, you know, to make my points. I use all kinds of devices, you know. Um, but I think um, it's very complicated um, to try to kind of reproduce the way we view the world. So um, that's one of the things that we use in my culture you know, is metaphor and poetry and, you know, open-ended kind of storytelling, all those things. You've talked recently mm -hmm. about um, wanting to challenge the notion that documentary is always associated with injustice. Mm -hmm. Tell me tell me what you mean by that. What, are you, are you, are you, I mean, I know that, for example, POV, right, we, we, get a, we, we catch a lot of flack for, like, never having anything fun, never having anything funny, <laughs> you know, like, just, just being, <laughs> just being dreadful, like, like death and destruction and crisis and you know like genocide all yeah. the time. Um, tell me, tell me what you mean by associating what 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 else would you like to associate documentary with? Oh, with with playful, playfulness, with comedy, with um, you know, there's stories that are so funny. They're um, with everything with art. You're right. I mean, there's this seriousness that is just overwhelming. It's like a dark cloud over our heads, right? So <laughs> <laughs> but some people are funny. That's the, I'm being unjust. But um, I think those things have to be developed. And I think our imagination has to fly in documentary. And what does that look like? Is that about, is that about an an increasing frequency of cross-genre work? Is it about... I think so. Yeah. I think it has to do with cross-genre. I think it has to do with including other things into documentary and always kind of adhering to the notion of, you know, the truth in a sense. You know, I, I do think that that is the great thing about documentary, that we're adhering to truth as we see it. But at the same time, within that truth, you know, there's a lot of possibilities of art, of, you know, imagination, of poetry, metaphor, you know, allegory, all that. I think that because the film industry started in the United States, we have a veneration of a way of making films. And, um, and we kind of all adhere to it, you know, and we want to stay within those limits. When we get out of there, it's not understood. But if you live in these two worlds and you see Latin American filmmaking and see how um, disrespectful of that they are, how adventurous they are, how they're willing to cross genre, to cross anything, to do anything, it inspires you. 
you know, and it has to do with um, just, I think it has to do with the weight of history in the United States in every way, not only in narrative, but also in documentary. Okay. And in, in Latin America, there is in that respect, you know. In Juarez, predators have no trouble finding their prey. The only facts about the victims I was sure of were they were all poor, slim, they were dark, and they had shoulder-length hair. More and more women were murdered and nothing was being done to track down the killers. So fear began to take root. All kinds of bizarre rumors and speculation were in the air. By the mid-1990s, 50 young women had been reported killed. The people were terrified that a serial killer was on the loose. Senorita Extraviata is, is so beautiful. The crosses and the, and the feet, and they're just like, there are moments throughout the bo your body of work um, that seem like they're so specifically yours. Um, talk to me a bit about how, you're, how you were nurtured and how your imagination sort of manifests itself in your work. I think it's true for a lot of women that uh, the father, if the father fosters you and tells you that things are possible, I think you accept it. When the father tells a girl things are not possible, he limits her. He kind of, it's interesting. I, I, I actually have investigated this with some of my friends. My father, he showed me a newspaper and he said, you see this? Look at this girl. She crossed the English Channel, and she was your age or, you know, older. But um, you're a really good swimmer. I think you can do the same. In approaching filmmaking, I never felt the strictures of, that other people felt. I felt like, you know, this is a way to be free. This is art. And if the father says, you can't do it, you must marry, you must not think about that, you know, whatever, Somehow, either you do it or you rebel against it. But my father said, no, dream, dream, and dream as big as you can and as far as you can. So I was very grateful for that. Selena, I really liked also because she looked normal. She was gorgeous, but she had a normal look. She was just beautiful. You know, when I was growing up, I wish I had somebody like Selena to look up to, somebody that looked like me, that looked normal. Well, here she was more, she was more Mexican than American. And over there in Mexico, she was more American than Mexican. You see, the majority of the stars from Mexico and Latin America are all real light complected, blue eyes, green eyes, blonde hair, and all the La Tele novelas, all the stars are, look, they look more like Anglo than Hispanic. And she had, you know, the bigger lips, big hips, the whole works. And people related to that because she looked more like us. Women have been, you know, um, not represented properly in my view, you know, or I felt that way. And um, myself and Susana Munoz felt that way when we made Las Madres de Plaza de Mayo. They were considered the crazy women of the Plaza de Mayo. You know, they were not really given their due. So um, in, in investigating the story, we figured out, you know, this is not right. Let's make it right. What are they really doing and what have they really done? And I think over and over again, my interest, totally unconscious, you know, um, of investigating the role of women in political activities or in human rights, you know, has kind of surfaced to the top you know, and um, it wasn't something that I set out to do consciously, is my point, mm. you know. It just, 
It just happened in a way. You've also said that, that men and women come to documentary filmmaking with different objectives. Sometimes uh, documentary filmmaking is only a kind of a, a, a springboard for feature filmmaking in, in some people's minds, I think. And um, this has happened actually with a lot of men and not so much with women because women, I feel, or women of my age, felt limited and, and you know, there were these, um, I won't call them glass ceilings, but you know, big fences <laughs> where we couldn't go. So we had to make the best of what we had available to us. You know, I, and I think a lot of women have excelled in documentary filmmaking because of that, because they know that this is, this is their territory. Eso lo que el gobierno diga no no es que dice mentira, miente, miente. Hace dos años que estamos así. Mi hija años... estaba embarazada de cinco meses cuando se la llevaron. Mi nieto tiene que haber nacido en agosto del año pasado. Hasta ahora no he podido saber nada de él. ¿Cuántas son ustedes? Miles, 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 miles en todo el país, miles. ¿Acaso ¿Me, la... ¿Me permite? Nosotros solamente queremos saber dónde están nuestros hijos, vivos o muertos. Angustia porque no sabemos si están enfermos, si tienen frío, si tienen hambre, no sabemos nada. Y desesperación, señor, porque ya no sabemos a quién recurrir. Consulados, consulados, embajadas, ministerios, iglesias, todas partes se nos han cerrado, todas partes se nos han cerrado las puertas. Por eso les rogamos a ustedes, les rogamos a ustedes, son nuestra última esperanza. Por favor, ayúdennos, ayúdennos, por favor. Son nuestra última esperanza. Talk to me about collaboration. Oh. Right. You have been collaborating with a specific group of, of, of filmmakers for quite a period of time. The editor Vivian Hillgrove, uh, Susana Munoz, uh, the cinematographer Kyle Kibbe. Tell me about your sort of core group of collaborators and that relationship and how it serves to strengthen your work and your vision. Well, I think it's like a marriage. You know, it's like a family. You create a family of collaborators. For example, like with Vivian, I started from the very beginning with her. And it's a relationship where it no longer needs to be translated. You know, we understand each other's language. We understand each other's tastes, you know, and abilities, all that stuff. You know, the same with Kyle Kibbe. But there has to be constant communication. The same with Jose Araujo, who's my sound man, and um, you know a lot of the other people that have worked with me. All of it has to do with similar taste, similar political views, and just the ability to get along with each other and to kind of love each other. I think we all love each other, you know, a lot, and it, and that's something people don't talk about. You know, sometimes. You collaborate with people, but it's always business, you know, it's always work. And, but there's also great affection between the collaborators that enables all this to happen. I make films because I know that I'm going to give them a lot of attention. And I know that I'm not going to make a lot of money. So it has to be a film that, um, that inspires me to create and to work because the most satisfying part of filmmaking is making the film for me. So it better be a good love affair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know that some people take a long time to make their films and some people seem to sort of churn them out. What's your average, you know, sort of? Well, when I was younger, uh, my average was like one year of film. Huh. Crazy, you know? I think I'm crazy. You know, I, I, now it's not like that at all. The film that took me the longest to make was Almas Allá. Why was that? Because I think I was coming from uh, Senorita Extraviada, and that took a lot of energy, a lot of traveling, a lot of years of kind of human rights work. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was, um, you know, I, I was in a state of distress. You know, I had like post-traumatic stress syndrome because it was so horrifying. And the thing got worse and worse as the years progressed. And even today to this day, it's even worse. But I've kind of detached myself. 
and I have to go on and realize that I'm a filmmaker and not a human rights worker. So that, that's about as long as it took me to make, you know, Senorita took 10 years of my life. In your POV interview um, in 1999, when we broadcast your film, Corpus, uh, a home movie for Selena, you said, quote, we need to see our experiences validated, otherwise we don't exist. And if we don't exist, we have become diminished by the media and we can't allow that to happen. Can you talk about the affirmation of seeing oneself on film and why that's important to you? You know, I knew that I could never make like a Hollywood film that that's not something that was accessible to me. And it was very clear from the very beginning. And what was accessible to me was um, educational film. Hmm. So I figured, wonderful, there is a lot of freedom here so that I can express myself. And in the process of expressing myself, I recognized that we were not, you know, in any of those films, that our experiences were not validated, that our presence was not validated, validated and to this day if we we all we have to do is read the paper and see what's happening in Arizona I mean things have not changed that radically even though you know we are making films we are talking about our stories we are talking about our existence in our part of this country but at the same time there's a lot to diminish us so um, I feel that my work is not done yet you know, and I feel that the work of other people is not done, done yet until we really are represented in the media in, a, in an equitable way.